Well, thank you. I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, this is a, a first for the club, I believe, to do a panel discussion affiliated with one of our exhibitions. And so, uh, how many folks here are with the Nevada County Camera Club? Almost everybody. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you for those who are not affiliated with the club. We're glad to see you and hope that you join as well. So tonight, this is a panel discussion that has to do with our current exhibition here that's behind me, which is Visions in Monochrome. So the Visions in Monochrome exhibition is the second year we've been here at Center for the Arts. And round of applause for Center of the Arts for hosting us. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for being back here. Um, and we've been invited back for next year, too. So this is a spectacular space and one that really shows off our work just brilliantly. So we're thrilled to be here. And so uh, as an introduction, I'm Rachel Rosenthal, past president of the club and kind of the overall organizer of this exhibition. Uh, and I'm going to let the panel members behind me introduce themselves in just one moment. And so the idea tonight is we've got three club members who are outstanding photographers in their own right, and they have images here in the exhibition, and they're gonna to talk to us about what makes a really fabulous black and white print. Share with us kind of their perspectives, their tips, their tricks. And I'm gonna be asking them uh, questions, and you will be able to ask questions at any time. Please raise your hand. But just know I am gonna keep this moving along because I wanna make sure that we can hear as much from them as possible. And as a little bit of background too, this particular exhibition is part of a new effort called Photography Month, if you're, if you're not with the club. April is Photography Month for the greater five county Sacramento region. And the idea is to elevate uh, art, artistry of photography. And so Nevada County joined last year for the very first year, Photography Month, and this is our second year to participate. And the club has a whole host of activities I'll share with you at the end. So, all right, you guys. All right, so let me see. I'm just with that. That's I think that's enough. So enough about the background. And so what I'm going to do is ask each of our three panelists to just give us a short introduction uh, about themselves and their photography, and then we'll move on to the questions. So with that, I will start with our club's president, Mike Shea. Well, well I'm Mike, and uh, I am the current president, as Rachel said. And I started, I guess seriously thinking I was going to be into photography back about the 19, early 1970s. And, um, and then you know, I bought a house, so I had to start working on a house. I had kids, so I kind of let it go. And I, I couldn't go traveling to do photography, but I'm a guitar player, but I could sit at home and play my guitar. So I kind of went from photograph photography to guitar. And then about 20 years later, um, the kids were, were grown up and you know started getting back into photography. So I've been doing that for the last about 20, 25 years, something like that. And um, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Robert. Hey, Robert. Uh, my name's Robert Arnold and uh, <clears throat> let me make sure I sound good. Look okay. good. <laughs> this is a test. Okay. Yes, that's good, that's good. Okay. Uh, well, I've been an uh, advertising photographer for over, uh, over 50 years. I've been an advertising photographer for over 50 years. Is this on? Well, get really close. close. Really close. Yes. Okay. Anyway, I've been a photographer for a long time, over 50 years, commercially, and uh, had a studio in San Francisco for uh, 27 years in one location. Um, I've specialized in black and white for the longest time. Um, I just prefer black and white. Uh, not that it's uh, anything better. Uh, it's just more graphically uh, pleasing for me. When I look at photographs, I really look at them kind of uh, in a graphic sense. Uh, the shapes, the form, the, the way light falls on the subject. Anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, coming from film. Um, and then I embrace the digital age and uh, I'm looking for uh, artificial intelligence, the next frontier. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I'm gonna pass the uh, mic to lovely Helen. Some water. Oh, here. Okay. Hi, I'm Ellen. Um, so when I was a kid, we had three channels and most of the time it was really boring. So I spent a lot of time flipping through National Geographic magazines, 
and Ansel Adams photo books that my mom had on the coffee table. And I always wanted to take pictures like they do in National Geographic. And it's very frustrated that my mom's 35 millimeter point and shoot film camera wouldn't, you know, didn't get that. And so anyway, so I kind of let that slide until I was about close to 30. And then um, I was gifted a digital camera for a trip to Australia. When I went to Australia, I took images that tried to reflect how what the scenery made me feel. And Australia is a fantastic place to photograph. It is so, there's so many weird landscapes and features and it was just so fun. And so I really got to, and with the digital camera, I got that immediate feedback. And so I just was kind of played with digital photography and I was self-taught for about five years in, oh no, seven. And um, I was working for a university at the time and one of my um, benefits was tuition waivers. So I was able to enroll into photography class. So I learned film and experimental photography, which just blew my whole world open. I absolutely loved it. And living in Alaska at the time, I mean, that is a, an amazing place to learn photography because the landscapes, the, the wealth of people and photographers and present presentations that come up, it's like, oh, we've got National Geographic this week. You know, and, you know, we just, so we're just all, it was, I just had an amazing, amazing education. And, um, and then I moved back here and I tried to continue that, um, continue that. And here we are. All three. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you all. And I will, I have to comment that Ellen's the great mastermind behind this beautiful exhibition. She has lots of experience hosting exhibitions and the look and feel is directly due to her. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll start with the first question. And I'm gonna put this one to Mike is how is black and white different than color? Well, to, to my, I, you guys are, most of you are photographers, so you, everybody's got their own opinion. So in my mind, I mean, would you just, even if you're sitting there and you look back here with the black and white, what do you notice? You notice the lightest thing and the darkest thing. Those are the first things that are gonna grab your eye. And, to, and with color, that might not be it. It might be a color that grabs your, grabs your eye rather than what's, the, well, we always say, oh, the lightest thing's going to grab your eye. But with black and white, it really stands out. So I think that contrast between the light and the dark is really important in a black and white image. And I think that um, black and white has a nostalgic feel. And it, it also has a more artsy and more serious kind of feel to me than, than a color image. You know, it's just got this um, feel to it that it's like old timey. And, um, you know, like you take a picture of, let's say, a succulent that it might be green and it might be boring in color, but you make that black and white and you can do stuff to it to make it an outstanding picture. I mean, you think about the, the bell pepper that S, uh, Edward Weston is famous for. I mean, what if that was a color image? I don't think it would have the same impact as it does in black and white. So I think black and white, you can, take, you can take certain types of images in black and white and they can really be dramatic. And the same also goes for color. I mean, a sunset, a, you know, a colorful sunset in black and white, not gonna do much for me, but you, know, you see the reds and the pinks and all the pretty colors in the sky, you know, that has more impact. And the other thing about black and white, like I do a lot of musician photographs and there's mic stands, there's monitors, there's cables, there's pedals. It, there's all this extraneous stuff that musicians use. And in a color photo, they really stand out. But in a black and white photo, I can vignette the edges and you know, it, it just isn't as noticeable. So it's a great way to hide things that you don't really want to stand out in your photo. Also, if there's a weird color cast in a black and white image, you don't you don't get that. So, th to me, those are the, the main the main differences between color and, and black and white. So I'll ask other two panel members anything you'd like to add to that question. I think uh, oh, there we go. I think uh, getting to the uh, heart of the matter is that uh, whether the uh, image is black and white or color, 
Um, um, you think I know by now. Ice cream cone. Like ice cream cone. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Doesn't taste like ice cream. Uh, anyway, um, I think the image is the most important part, you know, whether it be in color or black and white. Uh, I think, um, to me, color photographs are pictures. Black and white photographs are art. I've always kind of looked at the graphic element of black and white. And when you're drawn into a black and white image, uh, you're, uh, you, you're in another world. Uh, the three-dimension uh, world out there is now cropped, and uh, you're looking at the graphic um, elements in a given photograph. The lights, the darks, you know, where the, where the uh, light is coming from and uh, where the uh, shadows and the uh, positive and negative um, image uh, brings you into it. And also it, uh, it's, uh, it just takes you to a, a place where a, like a photograph should be. That's, uh, I just really think black and white is the cat's meow. Okay. All right. I think they covered it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mike and Robert. All right. I'm a, uh, next question to Ellen is, uh, what is your favorite black and white photo? Is it yours or someone else's? Um. <laughs> Actually, until you posed that question, I was like, Okay, so my favorite photographer is Nick Brandt, and I actually brought a book with me so I could actually show you. Set it down, the mic down for just a moment. Let me hold it for you. Sure. I'll hold it close. Okay. Um, so I hope everyone can see me, but this is my, he is my favorite photographer. And, um, you know, and he's a wildlife photographer, which is very different than what I do, which is, you know, I'll leave a pinhole camera out for six months at a time. Let's print on a leaf, you know, all this weird stuff. But what I absolutely love about his images is that they have this absolutely gorgeous tonal range. They have, they're beautifully composed. They have this intense emotional impact. And every time I look at this image of this ranger, cradling these tusks from an elephant that has been killed for these tusks in, in this dry, cracked earth. And it's just a powerful, powerful image. And what I, you know, for all the weird stuff that I do and all that, um, what I really would like to, I hope that my images achieve is an emotional connection to the audience. And if I can achieve even like a fraction of what this guy can do, I, you know, I, I think that's a, um, a successful image. And um, my other photo photograph of mine, that's my absolute favorite. Well, it was in the show last year and I didn't bring um, a, something to show you, but it's one that I made on film with, my, with one of my favorite techniques. And it's just, it's a panoramic image of a glacier and it's overlapping exposures. And I actually have it up on my wall at home and I just love looking at it. I never ever get tired. That's that's the other thing is I never get tired I never get tired of looking at this image. And that's that's the thing. If I can keep coming back to an image that is a successful image. Mark, do you have anything to add or no? Uh, yeah, I want to mention this this guy and I might mispronounce his name. Yusuf Karish. You know, so you know it. Not personally, but. Well, he, he's deceased, but he was a Canadian photographer that did a lot of portraits of famous people. And um, his stuff really hits me because um, he just, I think, captures the personality of the person that he's photographing. And um, so if you're not familiar with him, you can check, you know, check out some of his stuff. It's Yusuf Karish, and um, I just really like his stuff. Also, um, like that migrant mother picture by Dorothea Lang. There's a, a, a black photographer named Gordon Parks who did some really powerful, some really powerful images, you know, civil rights type images that are um, really wonderful. And um, since I do mu music photography, I like Jim Marshall too, who um, is a, was a music photographer. Um, um, no, I get, nothing more to say about that, really. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you guys. I hope we can capture these and maybe post the names of these photographers on our Facebook page. That would be good. All right. All right, folks. So then I will, I'd like to hear a little bit more from Robert. And the question is, do you specialize in black and white photography? Because I already know the answer to this, but I'd like to hear the why. Well, I'll keep it short. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I've always been drawn to uh, black and white photography, uh, just because um, of years of experience in the dark room. Um, I've got my jazz music on, and you know it's uh, it's uh, peaceful, and um, I just always like the uh, when the image comes up, you know, and you look at it, and all of a sudden this magical thing happens, you know. You're in the developer, and you're going ah, and you dodge and you burn because you want to do interpretive um, rendition of that image that you captured. Uh, always, for me, is uh, the important part is capturing the image correctly. You know, you want to make sure you get the exposure right. Um, before I start using Polaroid, you know, I had to kind of uh, uh, go with the, the zone system. Thank you, Ansel. And um, it, uh, you know, you expose for the uh, uh, shadows and you develop for the highlights, you know. And if you get a great, great um, negative, uh, then it makes your printing a lot easier. Uh, I, I still specialize in black and white. I, oh, that's something that I want to mention, and I'll, I may take a second, but I think there's a challenge out there that everybody ought to try. Everybody has their digital camera, and it has a monochrome selection on it. Spend one day just shooting with that monochrome only. Don't go in and shoot it color and then change it later. I think it will help you uh, appreciate uh, the values, the graphic elements, of, the, uh, of taking a photograph and just spend the whole day. Don't cheat, you know, we don't need to because it's a learning process. Thank you. All right. So Mike, how about back to you? It says, how and when during the creation process do you determine whether an image should be in black and white or color? I don't know, I mean, for, for me it's kind of hard. It's like sometimes you see something and I don't analyze it, I just go, oh man, that, you know, that's gonna be a black and white photo. You know, it just, it's just like an intuitive thing. When you see the scene, it just automatically resonates that that's gonna be, you know, that, I'm gonna do that one in black and white. And I, and I don't know, I mean, I can't really put my finger on you know, what, that, what that is in me that makes me feel that way, but um, there you have it. Let me see, let me refer to my notes because I might have something else to say about that. Um, yeah, so like a, a, the other thing I do, I do a lot of uh, dance photos. Thank you, Douglas, for setting me up with that. And um, the, the costumes are very colorful most of the times, so in those, you know, I want a color photo because the, the color in the costume to me is also important. But then sometimes just the dancer will take a really cool looking shape and that to me would be a black and white photo because the shape is the important thing in that, in that instance rather than um, maybe the color in the costume. Thank you, Mike. And Ellen, would you like to add to that or? He said it. Perfectly. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So, Ellen, the next question back to you is uh, What is your preferred processing software or other photographic techniques? So, I still shoot in film and I do shoot in digital. I, I like both. Um, each has, I, I don't feel one is superior to the other. I think each has their qualities. Um, so when I do process digitally, I use Lightroom probably for 95% of what I do, and partially, and that's partially because that's what I learned on, and I just find it, for me, I find it simpler. It does the majority of what I'd like to do, uh, you know, and especially if you have to do a lot of processing, like you know, if I photograph like a show or when I did real estate photography, um, it was just so much easier to be able to. Um, manage and process the images and uh, keep them organized. Um, and then, 
So, and then another tech, neat one, when the one I shoot film, I do, so I do have a, I have quite a collection of cameras. I have uh, 35 millimeter cameras, and I have, um, and so those I tend to use for more, like, straight photography, and I really do love using them. There's just something wonderful about film, because um, it just, to me, it feels different than digital, and I, and other photographers that have shot film have said the same thing, and it might sound kind of kooky, but it just it just feels like it absorbs more of the emotion that you put into it. And I know, physically, that's not really possible, and that's kooky, but I swear to God, it's true, in a way. Um, but what film does is that you have to really slow down and think about what you're doing, because with digital, and you know, and it's great for when you're just like experimenting and playing around, with digital, you can shoot all you want, but with film, you have to like stop and think about it and really consider what you're doing before you fire that shutter because film is expensive and it's getting more expensive and then you have to develop and it's very, it's a lot more intensive. Um, and I, um, I still develop film at home in uh, my kitchen sink. I have a little changing tape tent that I can you know, load my film into the reels, and then um, I actually have like a special tub that's just for film development. So I put it in the sink, and then I go through through that process. And then um, I, I don't have a dark room, but I do have a great digital scanner. So I'll scan the negatives, and then I will do some digital processing them on on the end. And then I will use digital printing just just because I don't have a dark room. And and then when I'm shooting film, the other cameras that I like to use is, this is my favorite camera because I've made some of my very, very, very best work with this camera. It's called a Holga. It's plastic. It's cheap. It was maybe $30. I mean, I mean, it sounds cheap. It looks cheap. It's imprecise. It's not, you can't even, you don't even know what shutter speed you're at. It, there's just like a picture of a mountain, a group of people, so you don't even know really kind of what settings you're at. And then if I wanted to use filters over it, um, well, I do use a yellow and a uh, circular polarizer, and I have to sit there and I have to hold it with my hand, I have to tape off the edges, but it can create some of the most amazing images. Um, and I can also advance the film as little or as much as I want and just look and see where the film is. There's a little window. I have to tape it up. There's a little window on the back that tells me what it is and I crank it forward. But I can crank it as little as much as I want. I can take an image, crank it forward just a little bit and take another image exposure that overlaps that and it can create these landscapes or these scenes that do and do not exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then actually in my image in the show, that is actually the, the technique and the camera that I use to create that image. Is that, is that a 120? It is, yeah, it's medium format. And afterwards I'll even let you look at it and play with it if you want. So. Um, so it's actually, I actually have another one that's a TLR where you can look through the top of that one does have a flash. This is just the, yeah. the viewfinder. Um, do you take this all off? I have a friend, a friend who first turned me on to a bow and she said if you shoot with it, you not, you got to, I had to go find little skinny tape and I always tape it all around. Do you tape yours? Oh, I do. Yeah. No, I have to. And her question was like, I, yeah, I have to tape off the edges yeah. where the um, so that I don't get light leaks. Sometimes light leaks though are really cool. There's some really cool things you can do with that. So. Yeah, I, I just had to share this with you because Ellen was talking about when she's loading her film into the canister. So when, when I started doing developing my own film, you know, I had that little little black uh, circular canister. And I was about 19 or 20 years old, and I would climb down to the bottom of my bed sheet, you know, have the covers on my bed, climb down to the bottom. So I'm, you know, 19, 20, uh, sheets, it probably got changed half, once or twice a year. Yeah. Man, it was smelly down there. But that, and that's where I would load my film under the reel, 
you know, it, so it was fun. <laughs> Thank you all. Very interesting. And yeah, come up and look at her camera after this is all over. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to circle back to uh, Robert, back on your challenge to us to shoot in black and white. So let's, okay, if I try this, set my camera on black and white. Okay, so if I'm going to do this, shooting specifically for black and white, what do you look for in terms of shooting that might be different than what you would look for in terms of color? <laughs> the graphic image. Oh, here. That, okay, I can, I can yell out. You want to hold that for me? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, the graphic image, that's what you're really looking for. Um, where the subject falls within the frame. Right now, this if, even if this was in color, it would be a great photograph. The subject matter is one thing you're looking for. This guy with the uh, um, tusk, uh, or elephant horns, what do you call it? Uh, tusk. Tusk, uh, and the way he's placed within the frame. And uh, if uh, it was cropped any, any differently, um, huh, the before and the after. Um, this, uh, again, this is a real, really powerful image. Um, and you really have to look at the, uh, the lines in the photograph, uh, the way he's looking into the, uh, in, into the photograph, um, the way he actually, uh, thank you, the way his eyes actually brings you back into the photograph. And the, the space that the positive, um, and this, I, I will call this the negative and the positive, each have value. Uh, and the difference between this and that, it can go, you can actually crop it up here. All of a sudden, it's a different photograph. Now, uh, when you're doing that in your, in your digital camera, um, you have the, the, thank you, you have the uh, luxury of being able to see your images instantly. Um, if you're doing it uh, in, in film, I don't know, I've shot my share of <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> my father Guido Sarducci thing. Um, <laughs> and now we'll word from our sponsor. No, um, anyway, the, uh, you know, the, the black and white uh, process was very time consuming, very rewarding, but at the same time, if you screw up, it's a boo boo. <laughs> You can't really, uh, you know, you, uh, and if you're a commercial person, you can't afford to uh, uh, make boo-boos more than once, because then you're, you know, you're toast. Uh, anyway, I, I shoot, uh, I, I enjoy photographing digitally, and again, going back to that uh, that test, um, it's um, it's going to make you look at photographs a little bit differently, uh, even if you have your your iPhone and you uh, convert it into black and white. Uh, that's another way of doing it, but uh, really kind of train yourself on, um, well, like, here's the object, okay? And what are you going to do with it? Is it here? Is it there? Here? There? Whatever. Look at that object in the way it falls within the frame. And it makes you a better pho photographer. And I'm not going to jiggle this around because it's more than 35 bucks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Um, so next I'm going to uh, ask uh, Mike is that, can you describe for us your post-processing techniques? What's, what software are you using? Are you processing black and white in camera or are you converting in post-processing? And what software do you use? So um, yeah, I shoot, I shoot in color and um, I post-process with Photoshop. I don't use Lightroom because I started out with Photoshop and it's like, well, I don't want to have to learn something new. So for black and white conversions, I use the NIC Silver FX Pro software. So it's got a lot of presets in there. And then there's also the opportunity to uh, emulate different film types, to put different borders on. To, you can dodge and burn within there. And, and my typical way of doing a photo is to pick things that I think I'm going to want to do something with, and I make those selections. That'll be the first thing I do, is make the selections that I think, okay, I want to darken this, or I want to increase the contrast, or I want to lighten it, or whatever I want to do with it. So I might have four or five different selections within an image, and then I'll take it into the NIC software, um, and, and convert it to black, you know, I'll pick one of the presets that I like 
and um, and sometimes you know play around with a couple of different ones and and then um, you know convert it to black and white then bring it out of that and then do some further processing within Photoshop. So th that's my general um, method of, of, of pretty much any photo, uh, but with black and white, I do the additional step of using the Nix software to convert. Did you have to add the software? No? Okay. Uh, so that's software. There's something that I've been doing recently, and I really em embrace the, uh, the iPhone. Uh, capturing the image uh, in iPhone, I immediately go in and I go edit. And I go over and I go to uh, mono, or actually black, black and white. Uh, <clears throat> and then I could uh, either increase or decrease the exposure. I could uh, bring up the shadowed areas or the highlights, all within this dark world here. I mean, it's amazing. Um, some, some of my best work I've done recently uh, with with uh, the microphone, um, uh, no, with uh, my uh, iPhone, um, and sometimes when I'm photographing somebody, I I, sh I share what I'm doing. If I'm doing a portrait of somebody, uh, I'll go in, I'll capture that portrait, and I say, well, look, <laughs> this is what I do. Now, all of a sudden, the person <coughs> that I'm photographing is now engaged in the process, and they're looking at how I create and how I change the uh, image from color to black and white how I change the um, values, the tones, and at the end I always do a vignette, you know, I can kind of close this thing down, it's kind of like burning in the edges. Um, anyway, I get a lot of uh, uh, fa uh, satisfaction because I got this with me all the time. Yes. I even, uh, in my bed, I put it down at the end. <laughs> <laughs> You do. Yeah. 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 Right. This is a G-rated show. Yeah. Huh? Robert, tell, tell everybody what, what version of iPhone you have. Doesn't make any difference what it is. It all works. Yeah, but you can have a oh, this. IPhone. Well, this is a ten. This is a fourteen Pro. Fourteen. Yeah. 14. yeah. But I, I before that was like a, a twelve, and then before that was a ten, and then I'm not sure what it was. I think it was a watch. You know? I don't know. <laughs> yes. So to what you guys were saying earlier, do you ever just put the iPhone in monochrome and shoot in black and white with the iPhone? Can you do that? Yeah, I just did it. I just took a model. Oh, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Because I figured that would, Robert would like that picture better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like this yeah. Well, that's it in black and white. <laughs> okay. But a question. So Mike shoots in, in uh, color mm -hmm. and he, he, using the software, he uses the, you have six sliders. For, for different tones, you know, magentas and, and blues and, and everything for a black and white conversion. You don't have that in the iPhone. You don't miss that? You don't miss the the the, no. the adjustment of those, no. uh, those subtle tones? What, uh, I'm gonna get back to this. Uh, for example, um, yeah, let's change this photo. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna do that. Photo. Okay, let's take you for example. You, you're there, uh, handsome as you are. Take the photo, and then I will share that with you. I go right here, and I go, all right, there's the image. Uh, go edit, and I go right to that little thing that auto, uh, and then I go right here, and then I go into black and white. Uh, you've got dramatic, you've got dramatic warm, cool. I go with mono. So now, all of a sudden, that image becomes a full tonal range, you know? But let's say I want to bring up your lovely white hair. Okay. I, would, I would go in and, you know, I would uh, say, okay, uh, brilliance, you know? And uh, I, do it, I do this all in, uh, with, with my clients because now, all of a sudden, there's a, a magic that's happening right there. And it's right there. Here's your dark room and your light room and uh, an ability to share... Uh, uh, I always try to engage my uh, subjects when I photograph them. Uh, and it's important because it's you know, eye contact. Uh, not only your eye contact with the, pho with the person that you're photographing, but where are their eyes going? For example, that photograph I did of Ansel Adams, Ansel Adams back in 1968. It's around the corner. Yeah, if you have around, yeah he's coming out of the closet next week. Um, <laughs> anyway, he still, um, the, uh, th there was a workshop and uh, we were given uh, a Polaroid, and this is when Polaroid 4x5 just started happening, only black and white. 
Uh, and because I was introduced to Ansel Adams before, uh, I can call him Ansel. Uh, and I said, uh, Ansel, do you mind uh, modeling for uh, me doing a test with my Polaroid? So uh, um, he said, sure. And, rather, and he was looking at the camera all the time. And I said, well, it didn't look right. Uh, even though I couldn't, look, I couldn't look through the back of the camera, I pre-focused it. And I said, Ansel, look up at El Capitan. So he turned and I clicked that one shot. And that was it. And I got a good Polaroid out of it. And I've been, uh, I made a copy of it. And uh, anyway, it's uh, just kind of controlling and experiencing uh, a camaraderie with the person you're photographing. Even you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So back to Ellen. I'll yes. Um, and Robert does make a good point about you know editing um, in the phone. So when I, I, I use the phone's native um, editing app, but then I also like Snapseed, and then I also sometimes use one called Leonardo, and I actually can use that for layers and brush effects. Can you and say the name again? Leonardo. Oh, like yeah. DiCaprio. Like DiCaprio or. Yeah. Da Vinci. Da Vinci. Da Vinci. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also, um, but my favorite photo app to you, well, aside from the native one, but I like, um, there's an app called Hipstamatic <coughs> that I really enjoy using. And um, it yes. emulates different lenses and films. And so, I mean, I, go, I don't know how many, I, I like a ridiculous number, and I could probably have a million different combinations of different lenses and um, films that I can use. And it's like, some of them are monochrome, you know, films that it emulates. And then I can have like a really nice sharp lens, and sometimes it'll be like tintype, or sometimes it'll be something really um, strange, or like heavy vignetting, or it does like, um, there's one, I think there's like Dali, where it like makes things a little bit surreal. So that's a really kind of fun way to just be able to like play around with it and um, just experiment. So. Great. Oh, great suggestions. I can't wait to try these. So Robert, you? I just want to follow up as far as the photograph I took of you. And uh, okay. well, you can't really see it, but uh, one of the really important yeah. things is, well, okay. One of the important elements, as far as uh, I'm concerned, is eye contact. Even though I, you have your eyes closed, it was also the way that you... Oh, yeah, okay. Well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> anyway, uh, your, uh, your posture, and then the guy behind you echoed that. I cropped it, and then I, uh, I made an int interesting photograph. Uh, but it's all about what's happening in that frame. And you can do it on your iPhone, you could do it uh, you know, in your digital camera or your film camera, but just kind of pay attention to what's going on in the viewfinder. Um, that's it. Okay, so let's change directions here for a minute. We've talked about the taking of the photo and how you've processed it. I'd like to talk for a minute, since we are at an exhibition, about the, the, the papers and the way that you prepared these beautiful images for this exhibition, and I'm sure each of you did it in a different way with different uh, constraints or considerations. And I'd like to hear what those thoughts were as you prepared your image uh, for this particular exhibition. Mike, can we start with you? Well, I mean, I used the same process that I talked about a few minutes ago. And then I, I print my own images. I've got an Epson 7800 printer. And um, my favorite paper was uh, Ilford gold fiber silk, which they don't make anymore. And I think that, my image, I think that was the last sheet of that paper that I had. And, and typically when I'm printing, um, I'll, I'll just, I'll take the full sized image and I'll just pick a piece of it and I'll print a small, you know, smaller part of that so I'm not wasting a bunch of paper and um, just see how, you know, see how it's turning out, see if any further adjustments are needed. And, um, yeah, you know, I mean, my, my monitor is calibrated, but even at that, sometimes things print out a little bit darker and, um, you know, just, you know, make the adjustment based on kind of like a test sheet, you know, and then, and then do the final print and, and hopefully, it, you know, it'll be one I'm satisfied with. The tonality, glossy, matte? Uh, well, the gold fiber silk, uh, the setting was semi-gloss, I believe. Um, 
but it wasn't a matte because um, to print matte with my printer, I have to change all the the black inks, and it's an expensive process. So I'm, I'm not doing that. But I would love, yeah, I'd love to do uh, to print on matte paper. And if I get a new printer, I'll make sure it's one that I can do that. Yes, Shelby. So, so you're saying turn off the lights to look at? No, I, I don't do that. I, I did do it before and I did it now. Uh, so I think what Shelby's suggesting is, is that you've got your image on your monitor and you turn off your lights to look at it in the dark. And um, I guess it gives it a different effect or something like your that. I couldn't quite hear the whole question is, let's say you take a picture with a film. Uh -huh. You say you develop it digitally on digital paper, mm -hmm. but when you de develop it on film, old paper, old-fashioned paper, do you see a difference in the print? Mm -hmm. Like the Ilford paper? Like yeah. yeah, so I haven't done a side-by-side -side comparison, um, but I have printed in the darkroom before, like when I was at, um, in, at university in Anchorage. In Alaska, and um, I really did love doing darkroom work. There was, um, you know, I just I liked seeing a little bit of the grain in the paper and the tonality. Uh, and actually, and I did tend to, uh, I usually did use Ilford, and um, and I and I do like their darkroom papers, and um, and it, it just had a wonderful tonality. And digital prints have really come a long way. And um, I maybe I should try it because there are some of my darkroom prints. Maybe I could should print out and see exactly what the difference is. Um, so, but that would be really interesting to try. Yes. Now maybe if you ever um, processed your your pictures digitally and then gone through and had a negative to print oh. a no. wet process. Um, so actually, I have done that. I have, um, and I actually use that, uh, like if I'm working with cyanotype images, which if you're not familiar with that, it's, a, it's an analog process and it's UV reactive and it's a solution you can apply to like fabric or paper. Mm -hmm. And when you expose it to UV light, it turns blue, this really rich, deep, beautiful blue. And they used to use make blueprints, and that's how blueprints got their name. However, um, so but when I've, I but I have made digital negatives before to use um, cyanotype. The the advantage being, if you're going to do a wet process, you can every time mm -hmm. you burn and dodge, it's going to be different. So right, right. So if you do an inner negative, you get to do all of that in on yeah. Lightroom or something. Yeah, and, and, and do yeah. contact sheets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I had a friend up in Alaska who actually did do digital negatives, and, you know, that he printed out and then did do contact prints. And uh, he's super picky, um, so he was never quite satisfied with it, but most people that looked at it, it's like, oh, that's fine. Um, so I, I think it just depends on your own personal taste. But they're actually, they're, but they're really fun for photograms, which um, if you take darkroom paper um, and then you place objects on the paper and then it'll, you know, create kind of a, yeah, so, and actually, and so the digital negatives would be really fun for that. Cause I, and I did do that for like, I, I found like these really old, um, yeah, I just found these old prints in um, in a magazine from like the 1700s, and some of them were just really weird. And so I would, um, so I scanned them and then printed them as negatives and made photograms with them, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Can you speak to the paper that you use? Yes, and so when I do print digitally, um, so I have an Epson 600, um, oh, I forget the color sure, I think, but um, it can print both glossy and matte. I made sure to get a printer that could do both when I moved back. Um, so I if I'm color printing in color, I tend to use more like a semi-gloss paper, but if I'm printing in black and white, I find that I really prefer matte. And my favorite paper to print on is from Moab. It's called Entrada, and it's the 300 gram white, like bright white. And um, since my, um, and my printer is only 13 inches wide, so it couldn't take paper that was long enough to print the image that I have. So I actually bought a roll sheet, and it wasn't designed to roll with my printer, so I kind of had to get a rig it. And um, so I figured out about how much paper I was going to need, and then I had to like pre-cut it, but it's got a bit of a curl to it. So I had to get that flattened out, and I'd actually attached it to a carrier sheet. So what that does is, you know, to like something that's really, that has a little more, you know, stiffness to it so that it could pull it through the printer. And, um, and the other thing I like about that paper, not only does it sh um, print beautifully, it's double-sided sometimes. So if I screwed it up, I could just flip it up and try it again. Because <laughs> what I hate is when you're halfway through a print and the ink print gives out on you. That's the end product. Yes, yes. And you just have to, if you're looking for it, just make sure it says yeah. double-sided or single-sided. So. Uh, real, real quick, yeah. I like Red River. Uh, that's the uh, paper company that uh, I prefer. Uh, I've gone through Epson and Canon and uh, a variety of uh, different papers uh, for my printer. I was printing on an Epson 2400, and that worked uh, pretty well for the longest time. And then all of a sudden, one day, it decided to die and uh, go on the internet, and then that's what they do. They reach, reach a certain, and they, they, uh, they just don't work any longer. So uh, anyway, I now have a Epson, 38, 30, uh, Epson 3880 that I just purchased uh, on uh, Craigslist. Um, the ink for that is about 800 bucks. <coughs> and I hope I get more than two prints out of it. <laughs> But uh, anyway, it's kind of frustrating because uh, you have to kind of uh, program uh, the printer to uh, acknowledge the paper that you put into it. Uh, a friend of mine was doing uh, prints for me. He had the same printer, the 38, uh, the 30, 3880, and uh, he had it all programmed and he was using a Red River. And there's like a satin. Uh, I'm not too crazy about uh, glossy. Um, it's just uh, coming from, you know, uh, a darkroom guy when it's glossy was for the newspaper, you know, you print it out in glo glossy. Um, some of my favorite print, uh, paper when I was doing darkroom was Agfa. Uh, they had some beautiful uh, Portriga Rapid and, uh, and then also uh, the weight of the paper. And uh, you're also able to manipulate it after and selenium tone it. Uh, so it gives it another a look. Um, not doing that any longer, I'm gonna, gonna stick, I'll probably buy another printer. It's probably going to be cheaper to buy another printer than it is to buy the ink. Uh, sure. yeah. okay. oh, yes. I just wanted to add to what Ellen was talking about, about you added a, a sheet so, so it would feed. Yeah. So before I had the 7800, which is a, is a, takes roll paper, I had a 3800 that didn't take roll paper, and I kind of did the same thing. I wanted to print on canvas, so I, I would take a regular piece of uh, paper and attach it to the canvas and then I could feed, you know, I could feed a, a long sheet of canvas through my printer and print with it when it wasn't set up for that. So just it was a little trick, but kind of the same thing that, that you were doing. Lots of great tips. I, I will, I've, I'm not at these guys' level. One well, small, no, 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 no. just small one, it's not my tip. Back to Shelby's question about really getting the image that you really want, is I took a printing class by Charles Kramer, some of you may know him, and what he asked us to do, required us to do, was to have a, you print a small sample, just like Mike said, and then we had a white matted border, and you put your print inside the mat, it's about eight and a half by 11, 
and you set it on the kitchen counter and you live with it for a couple days. And every time you walk by, is that still really the image that you want? And so sure enough, I come back the next day and you walk in there and look at it and oh, it's too orange, it's too blue, it's too dark, it's too light. But he would have us just always, before you do that final print, let's do that test print in this white matted border. And I found that very helpful. Did you say his name again? Uh, how, do you print, how do you uh, set up the photograph for going online or going to be printed? What do you do differently when you print it compared to going online? Okay. Um, so for myself, when um, I print, you know, I do what Mike and Rachel did, where it's like you print out, you know, a small you know, just a, you know, just a small sample just to see if it's if it works. And then and then I t look at it, and I also try and be careful of the type of light that I'm looking under and the environment. Like, I have a red door, and if I'm looking at the red door at night, that could maybe influence it. And then I have another light that will make things look pink. And so, if possible, I try and look at it under sunlight. Not always possible, but otherwise I'll just go in my kitchen. Um, oh, yes, and um, sorry, I just lost the thread. It's okay. <laughs> so, what, was, what, was, what do you do during this? Oh, right, right, right. Okay, so I'll print, I'll look at it in the light, in the proper light, and then I'll go, okay, this is too dark, or that area, that okay, that needs to come up, or oh, this is a weird color shift, let's correct for that. And then I'll go back and make those corrections. And actually, one thing I will do for almost any print I do, and I, I print from Lightroom, is I take the curve, and from the very center, I just pull it straight up, just, just a hair. And that will just bring it up generally enough to you know, make it look right. And sometimes I need to pull it up a little bit more or a little bit less. Um, but that is my kind of general trick, but I will keep printing those little samples until I've figured out, okay, that, you know, the dodging, the burning, the color, you know, the contrast, and, um, you know, and just to make sure that I've got, uh, you know, sometimes I used to ha work with a printer where if it ran out of ink, sometimes it would slightly change the tone. So if that happens, I have to go back and make sure, okay, did it change anything after I changed the ink? So. Okay. All, right. All right, we've just got about, I don't know, seven minutes left. And so I want to throw it open to the, to the crowd. Uh, questions, okay, David's got one. Well, I was just gonna comment on Charlie, what he has you do in a lot of the the old great photographers they would have you have one light that's a consistent color temperature that you wanted to review your prints under so by putting them on the wall that i i think rachel's i i'm glad rachel mentioned it because one of the things that you do is charlie will tell you you put it on the wall for a week or two weeks do you still like it does it still look good you know, maybe it looks better, or maybe you always notice things that, oh, I didn't see that before. But to look at it under a consistent color temperature, whatever that might be. You know, and a lot of times they'll say, put it under the typical household lighting condition. Because that's when people, if they, take, they buy your photos, they're going to look at it on the, on the ha in their house under the, those kind of lighting conditions. Thank you. All right, yes, question for the um, panel. How do you choose which, uh, how you're going to uh, print the uh, image that you're gonna print? I noticed in several of the, there was one was with the inkjet, and then there's another with pigment and so forth. How do you make a decision on what way, I'm, is it gonna affect the, uh, look of the image in a, in a different way? Well, I've got a couple different things as far as that. Oh, there we go. Um, 
I have a couple of different ways that I approach uh, making a print. Uh, if I'm going to be making the print myself, and a lot of times it's in black and white, but if it's in color, um, it's a process that I go through, and I got to really make sure that my printer is working a lot. Because if you let it set for a week or two, all of a sudden you got yourself a cleaning thing going on. The newer uh, printers are supposed to be better, and that's why I'm looking for a better printer. Uh, I also, I send my stuff out. You know, uh, some, of my, some of my work I take down because I got a deadline. I go to Walgreens, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I sit there and I go, okay, how's this look? And I, all of a sudden it comes back. The damn thing looks good, even in black and white. You know, if you have a, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you got a really good uh, image that goes in, uh, then you have a, pretty, a, a, a better shot at making the print. Um, one of the professional labs I use is called Bay Photo. Uh, that's because I was using them. I was doing a lot of bar mitzvahs uh, in, the, in the day, and uh, I, uh, they did my bar mitzvah books for me. And uh, that was really fun, because as a graphic designer and photographer, I was able to not only uh, take photographs of this wonderful event, I was able to create books. And they always came back uh, uh, better than I sent them. You know? mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it's uh, good to find a good lab. Um, another thing I want to mention, I know I'm, like, I'm looking at the time, right? okay, five, four, three, two, one. Uh, something else that uh, we were talking about uh, making prints from a digital file, uh, there's some companies out there that, uh, that will do it for you. You provide them with a digital image and they will give you a silver gelatin print for about 85 bucks for an eight by 10. But it's worth it if you're gonna sell it for 86 bucks. <laughs> Yeah, on that note too, I'll add in. Bay Photos local, yep. but you know, they're in the That's Bay close, Area. Yeah. Right, Costco used to be phenomenal. Yep. Costco is shutting down all of their photo services. Oh, yeah. yeah, they pulled them out of the local stores and made them online, and now they're shutting down everything. So but that's unfortunate, because they were excellent. You still have a chicken for five bucks. <laughs> all right, other questions from the crowd for, for our experts here. Dee? Yeah. Charles Kramer? I just wanted to get the name. His name is Charles Kramer. C-R-A-M-E-R. Okay. Okay. -E -E Charlie's no longer teaching. Oh. He's retired. Right. So He was a gem. I have his book, happy to share it with you, okay, that I got from the workshop. And Donna, did you have a question? Yeah, I have one question. When you go out shooting for black and white, specifically, you can do that. Do you use different camera settings than you would for color? No. No, I, if it looks good, I'm good. You know, I mean, uh, I, uh, pardon me. uh, I won't be too long. I, four, three, two, one. Uh, I follow directions. Um, anyway, when, uh, uh, when I'm out there photographing, I'm using my iPhone, uh, I, uh, or if I'm using, I've got a Canon 5D Mark II, uh, I've set it on mono, and I kind of, uh, uh, I'll t do a couple of test shots, I'll look at it, and then I'll adjust it. But it's kind of, uh, I, I'm kind of like an improv photographer. You know, uh, it's yes and, you know, you do it. And it's uh, time to me to pass the torch. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right, so I think we're going to uh, bring this to a close um, and ask these folks if they have any last words in just a minute. But as we finish, this has been fantastic. So thank you guys. Very well done. Yes. Very informative. And I'm going to write, go home and make notes of all your suggestions. Uh, I did want to encourage you, if you haven't done already, in the right, back that way, there is a People's Choice Award. Each person gets one vote for your favorite image in this exhibition. So please uh, vote, and we're going to announce the winners at the club's April general meeting. So looking no forward to see. Pardon? No cheating. Uh, no cheating. Okay. All right. And also wanted to just also let you know the other events that the Camera Club has for Photography Month right now at Courtyard Suites. We've got Gold Country on camera, led up by Kathy Triolo, and those were, uh, the, the opening reception was last, was it Friday? Friday, Saturday. Saturday night, and that will be up for the month of April. Then we also have uh, photo walks open to the public, and Ray is leading those. Raise your hand, Ray. And so the dates on those are 4.15, so income tax day, 2 o'clock here in Grass Valley, right here at Center for the Arts and on the 22nd at 2 in Nevada City at the Robinson Plaza. And there's a night shoot April 29th at 7.30 in Nevada City. So talk to Ray if you'd like to join us. There are so many cool things to shoot in Grass Valley in Nevada City. 
Uh, we have Not on Solid Ground is a four club member exhibition at Nevada City Winery. It's, down. it's already down. We took it down. You took it down, I'm sorry. It was excellent, all right. And then um, there's an exhibition, wildlife exhibition at Edward Jones by Dick Mooney. Oh, it's wonderful. So, so she's saying it's wonderful, so please get a chance to go see that. So with that, please give a huge round of applause to our <laughs> panelists. And then any last words they wanna share with us? So yeah, there's a, um, for black and white photo competition, there's something called the Black and White Spider Awards. So spider, just like a you know, itsy bitsy spider. So check that out. There's some really tremendous images there. I think the competition's still open. It's over. Oh, it's over? Yeah, it's over. Okay, it's over. So anyway, uh, but, but you can still go to the website and see some really wonderful black and white images. And the other thing to, to kind of, if you want to like try to tune your eye to black and white too, is check out some old black and white movies. I mean, man, those cinematography, just amazing. You know, what they, what they did with those black and white movies. You guys have the last, last words? Oh, I'll just go ahead. I'll okay. I'll be short. Okay. Um, so there's a magazine called Black and White Magazine. Yes. Oh, yes. yes, they are. Yeah, it's a really great magazine. It has all, and it's just, as the title would suggest, it's all black and white photography, all about black and white photography. They showcase different artists, and there's all, they always have, you know, submissions open for different things, and I've submitted, and I have been accepted uh, before, and it's really beautiful stuff in there. I want to conclude uh, and acknowledge all the uh, fellow photographers out there. I think we're a, a part of a privileged group, you know. Uh, we have the ability to go out there and look at three-dimensional three -dimension, three reality and capture it and echo it in a print. And everybody is just as good as the next person, sometimes even better, or not. But it's, it's improv. It's improv. You know, it's, uh, we, again, we're a, pri a privileged group, and I am proud to be a part of this group, and I thank you for letting us get up here and chit-chat. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah.